The best example of great horror, and it's all about story now, and that's what it's all about. It's all about story. And I will take this with me for the rest of my life. I have never come across a better story than the Night Stalker. <laughs> After Dark Shadows was a huge hit, I made two Dark Shadows movies for MGM. And I figured, well, that's it for me, the movie business. Yeah. Television, I've done television already. I know everything there is to know about directing now <laughs> and uh, all of that. Uh, and I got a phone call from Barry Diller one day. He said to me, we've got this terrific film. It's a horror film. I said, oh, hold on, Barry. He said, no, 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 we want you to direct this. You'll love this picture. I said, well, what's it called? Who wrote it? He said, Richard Matheson. Richard Matheson? Well, Richard Matheson was my favorite writer. And, I mean, I thought Matheson was a genius. So I said to him, look, I'll read it, okay, just because it's Matheson. But I'm not going to direct it. He said, then just produce it. Bring in your own director. Anything you want. Just want you involved with the picture. I said, well, I won't promise, but send it to me. So he sent me the script, and I loved it. I mean, I just absolutely loved it. So I called Barry back, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And well, it turned out there was suddenly a problem with Matheson. Because a while back, I had read, uh, it was um, his manuscript on Hell House. Somebody had gotten a hold of it for me. And this is when MGM was saying to me, you make any movie you want. And I found this manuscript from Matheson. So I thought, you know, great haunted house story. I said, this will be terrific. We'll do this, right? So I said, okay. Uh, I want to make this, this thing that, by Matheson. I'll see if it's available, and we'll, we'll make an offer to him. So we contacted his agent or whoever it was, right? and we offered him like $10,000. So when Dick Matheson heard that, that I was the guy who was going to come in to do the Night Stalker, he wasn't thrilled. So I, had a, so I have to fly to California to meet. I've got notes that I make on the script. I have to fly to California to meet with Matheson. Uh, <laughs> So I come in, and Matheson is there. We'd never seen each other face to face. I mean, he looks like he doesn't even want to talk to me. He doesn't even want to look at me. <laughs> so, you know, the one thing writers love is to be told they're great. So I figured, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll melt the guy down. Then I, I say to him, Dick, i got to tell you, you know, you're my favorite writer. You're absolutely extraordinary. You're, and I give him this whole thing. Not an eye blink. I mean, it didn't even make a dent in the guy. <laughs> They said, let's start talking about the script. So I had notes, and I guess the notes that I gave to Dick, he started to see that perhaps this guy knew what he was talking about. So he started to soften up a little bit. Uh, Dick's memory of the meeting was, <laughs> it's one of the funniest lines. He said, uh, it's very fortunate that I didn't rip his throat out. <laughs> Well, after the Night Stalker, uh, Dick and I became very close friends, and we decided to have to do a lot of things together. We did the sequel to the Night Stalker, the Night Strangler, uh, where we kind of sent the Night Stalker up. I mean, we got a little crazier with that in terms of of laughs than uh, than we did on the Night Stalker. How did I find John Moxie? When I was in England looking for a director for Jekyll and Hyde, that's what, back when I had the Rod Serling script 
and Jason Robards was going to play the part, none of which ever happened, incidentally, so it all may sound strange. Uh, I was in England interviewing directors. I hadn't yet started to direct. And uh, I met Moxie, along with many other good English directors. And there was a show called Arm, uh, Armchair Theater. There were mysteries. And Moxie and Charles Jarrett and number of other people were doing these weekly uh, suspense pictures for uh, for one of the one of the television networks. I forget which one it was. And I saw some of Moxie's work, and I liked it. And I hired Moxie to direct Jekyll and Hyde. And through a series of circumstances, that whole thing blew up. I eventually ended up making that with Jack Palance with a totally different screenplay that no longer used the Serling screenplay, went to something else, and made it up in Canada. But I re always remembered Moxie. So when I had to think of a director, I thought of Moxie. Darren McGavin was my first thought for Cold Shack. When I read Dick Matheson's script, Darren McGavin was the guy that jumped into my mind. He was my only thought, and we gave him, gave him the script, and he loved it. And Darren McGavin is the guy who truly made Cold Shack, Cold Shack. Only this time, he was seen. I got uh, Elijah Cook. It's me, Crawford. I came right out of the Maltese Falcon. I remembered him from the Maltese Falcon. I said, let's get that little guy in the Maltese. Elijah Cook. That's the way it happened. I saw your car parked here, so I got in to wait for you, and I got sleepy. You got sleepy. Hey, I think I found the house. Bob Cobert said to me, I think I've got the theme. I said, well, what's the theme? He said, I said, I'll whistle it for you. I said, no. I said, no. He said, I think I've got the theme. And I said, well, I want to hear it. He said, well, I've got nothing, nothing to play it on. I said, well, I've got to hear it. He said, well, I'll whistle it for you. I said, okay, go ahead. He whistled the theme. I said, I love it. You're hired. And that was it. And that's how I got Bob Cobert, and I have used him on everything I've ever done. I'm a great believer in narration. John Moxie's opening, I loved it, where he shot the big close-up of the tape recorder. Once you hear that voice start, you go, oh, man, this is fantastic. Chapter One. This is the story behind one of the greatest manhunts in history. Maybe you read about it, or rather what they let you read about it, probably is some minor item buried somewhere on a back page. What a great storytelling device, because it also helps you make your points and tell your story without doing a lot of stuff, without having to shoot certain things. And, and, and again, it is like background music. This will be the last time I will ever discuss these events with anyone. So when you have finished this bizarre account, judge for yourself its believability. When we finished The Night Stalker, nobody knew what we had. It was a little horror movie. Yeah, nobody was getting excited about it. Either was I. I knew it was a terrific movie, but I never assumed what was going to happen was going to happen. And the first inkling that we had something really incredible on our hands was when we screened it. We had an industry screening at Fox, and they had the big theater at Fox. And Barry Diller and I were standing in the back of the theater, and the place was packed, and it just filled with people. And the reactions throughout that screening were unbelievable. They were blowing our minds. We couldn't believe the way people were reacting to this picture. Gasping and screaming and laughing. I mean, it just, you know, it was extraordinary. So we knew we had a great movie in our hands. And then when I got to the ending, just wonderful. And the whole closing credit sequence, that was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. And I'd come on with McGavin, a couple of quick cuts, freeze frame, 
Darren McGavin is Kolchak names and down until we got down to the final one, which is a series of fast cuts of uh, the, the monster ending up with these huge close up of the bloodshot eyes staring into camera and as Janos Corzini, Barry Atwater, and the theater went nuts. People stood up standing and screaming and pounding their hands together and shouting. Diller turns and he looks at me and he said, we should have released this as a feature, right? Okay, so we knew we had a great movie on our hands, but we never ever assumed it would be the gigantic hit it was. The show ran, uh, I don't know, it might have been on a Tuesday night. It was up against normal competition, nothing easy, and little movie. They ran promos on it, and etc. Well, something must have caught the imagination of the public. It must have been the promos, maybe some of the reviews that they read. But it must have caught their imagination. And when the next day, when the overnights came in, I got this phone call. I don't know, remember who it was who called me. He said, we got a 54 share. At that point, the highest rated television movie was Brian's Song, and we blew it out of the water. Nobody could believe it. It broke all the records. Back in the 70s, when the first television movies started to be made, you know, they were 90 minutes, most of them at the beginning. The Night Stalker was a 90-minute picture. We shot it for $450,000 in 12 days, you know. Give me some idea of what happened in those days. But it was fun, because the way you made a television movie in those days, and the way you got one sold, totally different from today. Today, it has to be meaningful. It has to be socially significant. It has to be filled with stars. It has to have, oh, you name it, you know. <sighs> Come on, I get sick of the whole game and everybody plays that game today. To try to sell a television movie today is the most impossible thing in the world. First thing they say to you is, well, we like the idea, but there's nothing special about it. It has to be an event or and how, how can we sell this picture? I wouldn't know how to sell this picture to the audience. In those days, the way it worked was, I would go in to Michael Eisner and say, hey Mike, I got a great idea. I tell him a little story. He say, hey, that sounds great. Let's do it. There weren't nine people that you met with and we would do it. I had gotten in a habit where every script that we developed, it got made. I never heard of developing a script and not getting it made. Today, scripts are developed and redeveloped and developed some more and developed until it ends up as absolute garbage. Everything. In those days, we had fun. The Great Ice Ripoff, the Norlis tapes, any kind of crazy little movie that we came up with. And you got these different stories, these quirky little stories, fun stories. They didn't have to be an event. They just had to be entertaining fun, good, scary, dramatic, whatever. And we made them fast and we made them cheap and it was a great period of time. So that's it, the book's finished. And now you'll have to judge for yourself. I must warn you, however, if you try to verify this account, you will find it quite impossible. Item, in Washington, D.C., there was no longer a file listing the suspect under his true name or any of his alleged aliases. Item. In Las Vegas, all of those who were involved have either left town, aren't talking, or are dead. I haven't had a decent night's sleep since all this happened. And now you might find it difficult, too. Because there is still one fact that cannot be buried. After the death of Janos Skorzeny, he and all of his victims were immediately cremated.